there he goes into that drugstore. He's stepping on the scales. Weight, 239 pounds. Fortune, danger. Who is it? The Fat Man. emotion. A soft, sweet, warm, deep dream for two. But for two, strictly. When comes a third dreamer latching his wagon to the lullaby train, the dream becomes a nightmare and has a nasty habit of turning into reality. The grim reality of murder. And now, here's the fat man in... Murder squares the triangle. I was broiling myself a brace of double loin lamb chops when my doorbell rang at half past six. I answered the door and when she told me her name, I let the chops burn. Her husband, Mr. John C. Kinnard, was famous as a hot-headed but well-heeled gentleman who could write a check with six zeros. And I always say, rich or poor, it's good to have money. So I asked her in. You must excuse me for coming to your home, but it was urgent. You need a detective, Mrs. Kinnard? No, I need to get rid of one, Mr. Runyon. That could stand a little clarification. I know. The fact is this. My husband's hired a detective to follow me. It's John's considered opinion that I'm... Well, that I'm running around. And of course you're not. Of course I'm not. Believe me, my husband's attitude is completely without foundation. Okay. What is it you hope I can do for you? I want you to call this man off. Uh, The detective? Yes. Frighten him. Make him stop tormenting me. What method would you suggest? Oh, there must be a way of handling such a man. Mr. Runyon, if there isn't, I may not be alive tomorrow morning. You won't be alive? No. Why not? My husband, he... He'll kill me, Mr. Runyon. You're not straining your imagination, are you? I wish I were, but it's all real. The detective phoned me this morning. Phoned me and openly demanded that I give him $10,000 in cash, or else he's going to talk to John. What can he say? You told me there'd been nothing but sweetness and life. He's going to make up a lie, a hideous lie. Now, let me get this straight. He's manufactured a character, Mr. Runyon. Tim Foster, he calls him. Timothy J. Foster. And he swears he's going to hand John a report to the effect that he spied on Mr. Foster and me under very compromising circumstances. I can't imagine a man like John C. Kinnard falling for a gag like that. But the awful thing is he will. Without investigating? He'll shoot first and investigate later. What's the matter with him? We all have our diseases, I suppose, and jealousy is John's. A thing like this is all he needs to turn into a raging lunatic. You've got to help me, Mr. Runyon. You've got to do something. Okay, okay. What's the detective's name? Tanley. Fritz Tanley? That cheap bloodsucker. You know anything about him, Mr. Runyon? The landy. What? Nothing I'd care to mention in mixed company, Mrs. Kinnard. She'd spoken highly of her personal checking accounts, and the fee we agreed on made beautiful music. I knew Tanley wouldn't take orders from me, but remembering that the legal name for the gag he was working was fraud, I... Scraped the lamb chops out of the broiler and put on my hat. The phony in question made his headquarters on the dingy fifth floor of the Graham house on Willis Street. And when I knocked on his door a little while later, I found him in. 
Well, look who's here. Santa Claus's boy. What brings you here, Hanson? Come in. Thanks. Word is that you want to cash in big on a little game of tag you're working for Mr. John Kinnard. Anything wrong with that? As I hear it, you're threatening to make report on the antics of your client's wife with a Mr. Timothy Foster. And? And it wouldn't take a genius to nail you for fraud, Tanley, if it happens that Foster doesn't exist. Yeah. To coin a phrase, yeah. Who has it's got this idea that Foster doesn't exist? Not Mrs. Kinnard. Chance. By every chance. <laughs> must be a pretty funny sensation for her, then. What must be? Getting mail from a party who don't exist. What are you talking about? This. This letter, Onion. Exhibit A in my defense for Ford. May I glance over it? Help yourself. Thanks. I hold on to it. Spell it out from where you are. Dear Kathleen... Meet me tonight in the room at 26 Cabot Road. I'll be waiting at 8. Your own Timothy. How does that sound to you? Stylish stout. Where'd you get that? The bimbo Mr. Kinnard loves tossed it into a corner wastebasket early this a.m. <laughs> what happened to the fraud conviction, powerhouse? You plan to show that to your client, Tanley? Me? No. No, I don't plan to show it to him, Brennan, because... I already did. You don't say. 20 minutes before you gum shoot in. My watch said a quarter to eight. To Mrs. Kennard, I owed nothing except a loaded cigar. But I knew that if she kept that eight o'clock appointment, there'd be more fireworks than a Chinese New Year. So I left my gruesome brother detective, grabbed a taxi, and gave the address on Cabo Road. My watch showed a shade after the hour as I got out of the cab and rang the bell. I'd rung it three times before I saw the door was off the latch. So I went in. Timothy! Timothy, no! 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 (laughs) Well, well, well. (laughs) Looks like an early 4th of July. I'm Brad Runyon, Mrs. Kinnard. Remember me? Who's the man on the floor? It's my husband. Your husband? Yes. I see John came with a gun in his hand. What happened? A slight case of backfire? Tell me. Is he dead? He sure is. Oh, it can't be. It can't be. It's been, sweetheart. Sealed and stamped. The question before the house now is, where is the tenant? What? Where has he taken himself? I don't know who you mean, Mr. Runyon. Your friend, Mrs. Kinnard. My friend? The reference is to Timothy Foster. I told you this morning, Mr. Runyon, there's no such person as... You can cancel that speech, sweetheart. As it happens, I heard you screaming his name when I opened the front door. You did. Clear as a bell. Now, where is Foster? Who's Foster, Mr. Runyon? The man who was here with you when your husband walked in, Mrs. Kennard. The man who shot first without waiting to be shot at, and then took a two-story leap into the hydrine just through this window here. Really? Where will I find him? Tell me, or I promise you, pretty as you look, you'll hang as high as a Christmas goose. You know you're less attractive when you scowl. Where's Foster? Where does he live? What is it you two are making here, mister? Huh? Oh, who are you? Me? Pedersen. Janitor. I think was maybe from here a big noise, no? Reasonably big. The man on the floor is only dead. Yeah? Yar. What do you know about Mr. Foster? Mr. Foster? The man you entered this room to, remember? No, I not rent rooms. Not no tenants. My place is in the basement. Somebody rents these rooms. Who is it? Mrs. Heufels. She rents them. And where is she? He's on trip away to her mother's. When does she get back? Tell me she come home tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Well, that's the ball game, Mrs. Kennard. What do you mean? I mean you may as well open up. Mrs. Heufels is going to keep no secrets. She's seen Foster, she's dealt with him, and she'll talk so fast and loud. We'll know enough to land him in jail by tomorrow noon. Really? Really. 
And look, sweetheart, you're standing on the threshold of trouble deluxe. If you take good advice, you'll... Oi, 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 what's this? They're overdue already. Yeah, yeah, the police. Somebody else here, big noise. Somebody send for them. Well, this is it, Sugar Plum. There are going to be questions, lots of questions. There could even be confusion. You're so efficient. You're pretty, too, but this is no time for orchids. John C. Kinnard was a mogul in this man's town, and his murder won't go unsung. The newspapers will make such a noise, there'll have to be a conviction. It's nice of you to care, Mr. Runyon. Do I have to tell a woman of your intelligence that your own safety is at stake, Mrs. Kinnard? Do I have to tell a man of your intelligence that Timothy means more to me than my own safety, Mr. Runyon? <laughs> So it stood. She didn't bat an eye when the minions of the law crashed in, looked over the room, and took it to headquarters. But half an hour later, after a phone call, there was an attorney in Mrs. Kinnard's detention cell with a writ of habeas corpus and $50,000 in bail money. While they'd held her, they'd gotten strictly nothing out of her. And all Lieutenant Mackenzie knew about Mr. Timothy Foster was his name. So next morning, I decided I'd pay a call on the landlady of 26 Cabo Road, who was due back at noon from a visit to her mother's. Yes? Uh, Mrs. Hoytles? What is it you want? Like everybody else in town, I'm interested in last night's murder. Go away from here now and don't bother. Uh, you haven't started being bothered yet, Mrs. Heifels. Wait till the D.A. gets here. The D.A.? He, he, he's going to come here? In time, and not a lot of time at that, he's bound to. But if we get together and have the right kind of talk, we might manage between us to keep the police away altogether. So, call me inside. Who are you? Private detective. What is it you want to know? All about him. Who? Your second floor boarder. And who is it will look out for me? Why does anybody have to look out for you? That's the way it is. From a distance it looks easy, and the next thing you know, the world is on your head. I'm afraid I don't quite follow you, Mrs. Hoyt. Of course not, of course not. How could you? Go in the dining room and keep quiet. Why all the secrecy? Do what I tell you. Just sit down over there and we'll bring all this to finish. That's what I want. Wait till I close the door. You may wonder why I'm being so careful, but if anybody heard it, it might be dangerous. <laughs> from an unexpected angle. A gunshot, sudden and deafening, from far down the long and dim-lit corridor. I was across the room in two strides, but already the hall was as empty as a fireplace in July. Mrs. Heufel stumbled forward and fell. She fell under a picture of herself on the wall. A picture taken when she was very young. And very alive. <laughs> Heufels lay dead on the carpet. And with her passing went my best hope for a fast finale to the Kinnard killing. When I broke the news to Lieutenant Mackenzie, I could hear the ragged edge of despair in his voice. To soften the blow a little, I pointed out that now at least we knew Foster had been in the neighborhood as late as 12.15. After I hung up and sat a while in quiet speculation, my mind suddenly focused on a certain detective. A hard-bitten gent who had been overlooked. And as soon as the police arrived, I took my way once again to the Graham House on Willis Street.
Beat it, Runyon. Take it easy, Tanley. Take it easy. I told you to beat it. Is that the way to talk to a friendly colleague? The friendly colleague will either take himself a walk... Go on in and (laughs) sit down. (coughs) What have you got with me, powerhouse? Not much. Only a certain John C. Kinnard, who earned his money the hard way, might be alive today to enjoy it. If you hadn't stuck that note under his nose and let him go off on a rampage to get lead in his chest... I did what I was paid for. Why do you come off telling me my business? It just seems to me that the detective who actually spotted Foster with Mrs. Kinnard ought to have a pretty clear picture of what he looks like. Hmm. Did you figure that all by yourself? With a minimum of prompting from the audience. You say you saw him, Tanley. And who's saying not? How often did you see him? Often. How close? Close enough to know. Then let's have it. He's about six foot one, brown hair, gray eyes, walks with a cane and drives a black 41 Ford sedan. Thanks for the information, Tanley. I'll pass it along. Attention all city squads. Timothy Foster wanted for double murder. Description follows. Height six one, hair brown, eyes gray. Attention all state patrols, murderer of John C. Kinn out at large. Post guards at all toll bridges and highway entrances. Stop all suspicious vehicles with particular attention to Black 41 sedan. Attention all national police headquarters. Arrest on site Timothy J. Foster. Height 6'1", hair brown, eyes gray. Uses cane and drives 41 sedan. This man is a dangerous killer. And I did pass it along to the police, who broadcast it near and far. For 12 hours, the homicide squad struggled along on not a wink of sleep. And from all this labor, they scored a very circular goose egg. It crossed my mind that Tanley could have given me a bum steer. And shortly thereafter, I felt a craving for that note which Foster had written to his beloved Kathleen. I phoned Police Lieutenant McKenzie and asked him to drop in on the gumshoe and confiscate the note as vital evidence. Then I decided to pay a call on Mrs. Kinnard. I've heard the description of... of Timothy on the radio. It's quite accurate, Mr. Runyon. And complete? Complete. Believe me, I'd tell you if it was otherwise. I'm not interested in shielding him any longer. No. No. What happened? I've had time to realize what a fool I made of myself. None of it was necessary. I was just running around with Foster to taunt John. Oh, I see. To make him jealous. I was afraid he was taking me for granted. You see, I really loved my husband. That is news. He's gone now, and I can never undo what was done, but while I'm making every attempt to have deserved him. That's a little after the fact, Mrs. Kinnard. Tell me... How do you do such a thing? Well, for instance, his monument. I've written the epitaph myself, see? Here it is. What do you think of it? John C. Kinnard, a brave and generous soul, survived by his loving wife, Tina. Nice. Lovely. But who's Tina? Me. I thought your name was Kathleen. Oh, I was christened Kathleen, but to people who love me, I've always been Tina. I left her and went down to the drugstore for chocolate malt. Then, say, ten minutes later, I made a call to Mackenzie and asked him if he confiscated the note written by Foster arranging the fatal date with Mrs. Kinnard. He said he had. I then wanted to know if he had a handwriting expert on tap, someone who could not only analyze it, but write it. Again, the answer was yes. There was a graphologist named Mercer in the lab, and he was, at that moment, studying the note in question when Mackenzie switched me over. Mercer speaking. This is Brad Runyon. Oh, yes, Mr. Runyon. Do you have the Foster note nearby? Yeah, it's in front of me. You want me to analyze it? No, I want you to copy it. Copy it? Yeah, stroke for stroke, and write out the following. You got a pen? Yes, sir. Okay, here goes. To the police. What's that? Write what I tell you. 
To the police. Mrs. Kennard killed her husband. Yeah. I'm leaving town because I don't want to be involved. Uh, yeah. But I saw her pull the trigger. Have you got that? Yes, sir. I'll have it done in half an hour. Okay. Sign it, Timothy Foster. <laughs> headquarters and arranged with Mackenzie to take out the little document. And then went calling on that gentleman of the old school, Fritz Tanley. Hiya, Tanley. What? No cops this time? No, no cops. This visit's off the record, Fritz. Nice to see you so sociable. Sit down. What's on your mind? The Kinnard case is about to close. Huh? Thought you'd like to know. After all, you've been so close to it. What's the matter? Uh, nothing, nothing. Uh, what should be the matter? You look surprised. After all, a case has got to close sometime. Who says not? Well? Well, what? What's the payoff? Who did it? A certain much-discussed bimbo. Mrs. John C. Kennard, huh? Kathleen, Tina, the dead man's wife. You must be nuts. Why, Fritz? Well, well, I mean, how you, how you figure? Oh, new piece of evidence clinched the deal. What piece of evidence? This note, Exhibit B. It is a, a note. To quote you, Fritzy, it is not a piece of veal. Can I see that? Sure, from where you're sitting. You're far-sighted. Spell it out. Mrs. Kinnard killed her husband. I'm leaving town because I don't want to be involved, but I saw her pull the trigger. Who wrote that? The signature's there. Timothy Foster. And the script is identical with the first note. The one about the date on Cabo Road. You can see now why I say the case is about to close, huh, Fritzing? Uh, yeah. You're the first person to see this little billet do. Where did it come from? Under a sofa cushion in Foster's room at the boarding house. You found it, I take it? Who else? What kind of angle are you looking to cut here? Isn't it all too obvious? It's N.G., Runyon. Why? Because she didn't kill Kinnard. You mean you don't think she killed Kinnard? That's right. I don't think she killed Kinnard. Okay, you have a right to your opinion, Tanley. But nevertheless, she's it. Wait a minute. For what? You can't pin a rap on her with that note, Runyon. Oh, I think I can. The DA is hungry for conviction, and so is McKenzie. Tina will do. What do you mean, she'll do? I mean it has to be somebody, so it might as well be her. So long, Fritz. Hey, wait, wait. Listen. McKenzie's waiting for me, Tanley. She's innocent. She didn't do it, I tell you. She didn't do it. I can make out a pretty nice case. She had motive and opportunity. What about the murder weapon? I've got that, too. Found it in the hydrangea bush outside the window. You're a liar, you dirty swine. What do you mean? You haven't got the murder weapon. Who says I have? I say you haven't. Why not? Because here's the murder weapon. Right here. That's all. And it's going to come in real handy again. What do you mean? To put a slug in a too smooth operator. Me by name? Who else by name? Foster didn't write that note. You had it written. How can you be so sure? Foster could have written it, couldn't he? You know all about it, powerhouse. That I can see. You mean that there's no such person as Timothy Foster? Could that possibly be what you mean? Couldn't be that you invented him out of thin air to be a fall guy. Yeah, it could be. Could it be that you did more than trail Mrs. Kennard? That you caught up with her, fell in love with her? And invented a man named Foster to lure Kinnard into the trap of 26 Cabo Road? It's possible. And it's what happened. Yes, it's what happened. You rented the room from Mrs. Heufels as Foster. And when she was about to talk, you killed her, cool and deliberate. So she wouldn't upset your dream of a blue heaven with Tina Kinnard and her husband's millions. Was that the play, Fritzy? Exactly, King Size. And now, before we wind up your shining career, can I ask one? 
The floor is yours. How did you know all this? Just one of those nasty gags that nobody can count on, did the trick, Fritzy? When you wrote that first fake love note from Foster to Mrs. Kinnard, you had him address her as Kathleen. And then today, unsolicited, the lady tells me that to people who love her, she's always Tina. You knew from that? From that, I started thinking. Not bad, William. At my best, I'm very good. But not good enough to stick my girl with a trumped-up gimmick and get away with it. I never planned to stick her, Tanley. What do you mean? Oh, this was to get you to hand out a confession. Confession? To Lieutenant McKenzie, who's standing on the other side of that door out in the hall. For a moment, he doubted me. Then he decided I was on the level and turned, firing as he swung. The bullets went wild, nosing into the door frame. Before a third slug could better his score, McKenzie opened fire, and Tanley grabbed his chest and pitched forward like a sack of grain. I'll get it, Mac. Hello? Hello, darling. Who's this? It's Tina, sweetheart. How are you, Tina? You... You don't sound like yourself. Is this Mr. Tanley? No. Oh, I, I'm so sorry. Is Mr. Tanley there? Yes. May I speak with him, please? I'm afraid you can't. Why not? Because, Tina, Mr. Tanley's dead. Oh, no. No. Yes, sweetheart. And I think you'll find that little boy Blue will be blowing his horn in front of your house shortly, so don't go away. <laughs> Mackenzie took over then. As I left, he said little, but meant much. And he watched me descend as the wire cage elevator groaned me down to the lobby level. Now, out in the street and at the corner of 4th and Willis, there was a fruit stand with a pyramid of rosy wine saps, where I stopped and bought a sackful. Then I went on my way thinking that love is a nice emotion, a soft, Sweet, warm, deep dream for two. But strictly for two. Strictly. seems I spend my life in getting into trouble and getting out of it. But at the same time, I generally manage to get some other people in and out of trouble, too. Be seeing you again. So long. <laughs>